good morning, Seattle. How you guys doing? And good morning, everybody that's watching along at home from the live stream. I'm coming to you live from Seattle, from Emerald City Comic Con, here on the Sci-Fi Wire live stage. And as we all know, Sci-Fi Wire is your ultimate stop for all things geek and genre. I am the Fangirls Managing Editor, Cher Martinetti. And joining me this morning is Noelle Stevenson, showrunner hey of She-Ra. We have a couple She-Ra fans out there, right? Good, we're not gonna talk about that at all. We're gonna talk about ancient aliens. So anyway, <laughs> we were having just a very weird conversation waiting to come out here about all the weird stuff we like to watch. Just watch The Greatest Showman. Highly recommend. It's bonkers. Yeah. So much fun. <laughs> and then I was saying that there's like a documentary on Netflix, um, which we're gonna plug Netflix, obviously, because Shira, so. hello, Synergy. Uh, the Behind the Curve, which you absolutely right. have to it's watch. It's on my list. It's yeah, on my list. it's on the list. Um, yeah, so this is kind of insane that you're to be 27 and be a showrunner. Like, what is that like to achieve so much success at such a young age? I honestly don't think it's sunk in yet. <laughs> you're like, I'm been, completely like, unaware that, that that's my like, life. <laughs> No, I mean it's awesome. There's a, it's, it's. There aren't a lot of people who get to be in my shoes and get to express their creative vision like this with as much creative control as I have, and so I count myself very lucky for that. And it's just been, you know, something that uh, just you know, trying to enjoy the ride all, along the way. But it's been, it's been awesome. So I know that um, you've talked about this in other interviews about like Shira is a very unique property in the sense that it occupies this space in the zeitgeist where there are people that have this affinity to it and they're very connected to it from their childhood. And like, not to date myself, but like I had the Shira dolls when I was younger and everything, but I never remembered there being like a huge backstory or anything. It was just like, okay, here are Shira and He-Man and they're twins and like, here's their deal. And then go forth and play with all these awesome toys, which were totally awesome toys, by the way. Um, but now it's like, you know, you see fans get super connected to this thing and they, ha they feel some sort of way about a reboot. And I think she is unique in the sense that like, it didn't really have this huge backstory before. So what's it like to occupy this space where people have this preconceived notion of this thing, but it's really, it almost seems unwarranted. Whereas like the thing now, I almost feel like there's more, there's like a more of a backstory, more world building than there was with the original. I actually think there was a ton of backstory in the original. Like that was one of my favorite parts is that there's actually so much mythology in the Masters of the Universe world. My favorite stuff is the stuff where they're like, we didn't even get to do this. Like the show got canceled before we even got to this. Um, and I like wanted to know all that stuff, just like the, the plot lines that maybe never panned out in the shows. Um, but I did, I treated it as like, you know, what you want to do and I think why She-Ra has remained in the popular zeitgeist as much as she has, even before our show was developed, um, is that I think that they, they are, they're very evocative, you know, you want to know the story, you want to know what this wider universe is around the characters and you immediately you just, it's, it pulls you in. And so that was something I did treat it like, like playing with toys, where you're like, here are all these amazing characters, I wanna know more. What does this, what do these characters uh, tell us about the world that they live in? Like what, you know, kind of uh, story do they occupy? And uh, you know, all of my inspiration came from the original show. Uh, there's very few plot lines in our show that don't have some kind of seed from the original. It was just, you know, uh, here's what we have to work with. Let's just, uh, how would I tell this story? How do I want to like sort of evolve this story into something else, something new that stands on its own? Um, so that was a challenge for me. But honestly, the original show gave me a lot to work with. I'm, I, I it's really so weird because I really like, again, I'm, uh, it's been a long time since I played Bashira Dolls. But maybe it's because now fandom exists so much on the internet. So people are able to talk about things in a way that they never could, you know, 10, 20 years ago. I really don't remember there being like people so tied to that backstory that much. Whereas now I feel like it's such a big part of every fandom. Like you care so much about those extended universes and the, and the story and the world building. I think and it's, it's totally like the fans way. almost bring it to it themselves, yeah. where it's like you do have something. It's what's so fun about this property is that the people who made it were like, here's all the stuff we love. 
we're going to do all of it. So it's like, it's going to be princesses, it's going to be ponies, it's going to be robots, it's going to be spaceships, it's going to be, you know, pirates. It's like every single possible thing that you could love is there. And so then you have, because it is based on toys, you know, like here is a character whose chest is a car and he, he can drive on his chest like that. And it's like, and if you're absorbing these stories, and it might just be, we thought it would be cool to put wheels on this character. Um, but then you're watching it, you're like, what kind of world is it yeah. where people are also cars? <laughs> you know? And so then you start imagining whether or not someone's actually, if that backstory is actually written out or explored, you're like, well, what is Entrapped's deal? What's Catcher's deal? You know, like what is, you have this person uh, and this character and it's like, they're presented in this way and you want to know what sort of led them to be in that position. So I, that's what I mean by it being evocative. Like yeah. it might have been motivated by just like what toys are gonna be the most popular, what's gonna sell, but it also creates all of this intrigue and all these questions of just like, what does that mean for the world? What does that mean for the characters? And so a lot of my job was just trying to answer those questions as best I could. One of the things I, I really love about fandom in general is that people, you love the thing that you love because you find a way that you connect with it very personal. You know, it's a very personal thing that draws you to those things. What was something, maybe from your childhood, that you feel felt about the same way maybe a lot of She-Ra fans probably feel about She-Ra? So I was a huge Star Wars fan, a huge Star Wars fan. Um, I stole my brother's friend's Star Wars action figures and refused to give them back. Um, and I didn't know anything about Star Wars at all. I just had the action figures, so I made up stories for them. I made up names, and then I started getting into the movies, and I was just like, you know, I was done for it. I had like 30 minutes of like internet time a day at that time, and so I would just spend the whole time on the Star Wars website, just like going through all of the entries, reading about background characters, and I developed like this huge love for. Uh, I've told this story so many times, but, you know, it's true. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, the next question. There's no, a character in, in episode two, the best Star Wars movie, obviously, as we all agree. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's a character in it named Zam Wessel, who is a shape-shifting bounty hunter who dies five minutes in. Sorry for the spoilers. Um, and I became <laughs> obsessed with her at that age. And I took her action figure with me to see the movie before it was even out. And then I saw the movie and she died, and I was like, well, crap. Um, <laughs> and then I went home and I was like, I'm going to fix this. And so I created a whole story that was just about her. And uh, that's sort of, I think that's what kind of kicked off my interest in storytelling. Um, yeah. I stayed interested in Star Wars, but like I, I kind of splintered off in this direction of like, I really want to know more about this really cool looking shape-shifting bounty hunter. Um, and I think that that's sort of like that drive has brought me, um, it's been, I think what sparked every single story that I've told is just like zeroing in on some piece and just being like, I want to know more. I'm going to. I'm going to try and, and tell this story, flush this out, make this a real thing. The thing that I wanted to see the most, I'm going to try and tell that story. It's interesting because I feel like a lot of creators, um, they have a very similar type of thing that like kicked off that curiosity in them or made them want to be storytellers. And like even when I think back to like when I knew I wanted to be a writer, it was like I would read these like books that, were, that came with like a tape and they would beep when it was time to turn the page. And then after the story was done, I'd go back and I'd make up stories for the pictures. So you're basically making fan fiction. And you kind of were too. You were making your own little Star Wars fan fiction. So how important do you think it is for people that are fans to have that experience? To actually making be creating fan fiction? fan fiction, yeah. I mean, do it. It's great. It's so much fun. <laughs> I mean, I think that like we're all inspired by what we see every single day, the media that we love. You know, you say, I love this thing. Maybe I wish that this thing was different about it, but I, I love it, but I wish this thing was different. And then you say, look, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could tell a version of this that focuses more on this thing because that more aligns with my interests. And then maybe you combine it with some other interest that you have. And before too long, it's not necessarily recognizable as fan fiction, but it's, you know, you've been inspired by the thing that you love, which is where, you know, I, I think that all creation comes from in some ways. We're all inspired and, you know, sometimes all you want to do is just write a great fan fiction, which is great. Sometimes you want to expand it in another direction. Sometimes you want to tell your own thing that's inspired by those things. All of those are such incredible ways to create something and to have fun doing it. So I think, yeah, um, it's great.
What would you say the biggest difference is between creating your own title and property and then taking over something that already has such a rich backstory and history to it? I think you have a little bit more responsibility of uh, the original property. I've never been someone who I, I, I don't. I try not to look at it as gospel or as like something that is. You just can't change these things. It has to always be like this. You know. Obviously, we took a lot of liberties with this incarnation of Shira, um, but you, there is still a responsibility to the original property and to fans of the original property um, to try and keep at least the spirit alive. Um, even if you are trying to reimagine it for new audiences and bring it, you know, just into this decade. Um, so uh, it's it's definitely there's more to think about. There's more um, there's more hoops you have to kind of jump through. Uh, but I also think that it can be something that gives you a lot of really rich material to work with. Whereas like you know, making your own creation it frees you up to be able to do whatever you want with the characters and with the story, but I also, there's something that's a really fun challenge, I think, about working with a property that already exists, because, you know, you're giving yourself certain parameters and trying to solve problems within that, and that can be a really rewarding thing to do. Are we gonna see any completely new original characters that no one's ever heard of before in Shira that didn't exist in the previous version that are completely new and created by you coming up? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can tell who they are because they're the ones with the like normal Earth names, um, <laughs> typically. Uh, but yeah, no, there this are a lot. This is Bob, <laughs> Shira's best friend. Kyle, <laughs> the only original Shira character. <laughs> <My> OC. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there's a ton of cool new characters coming up, even in season two and beyond. Uh, I am so excited for everyone to see some of the characters coming. Some of them are based on uh, original Shira characters. A lot of them are actually, um, and some of them we did make up on our own. But I'm so excited for everyone to meet all of them. They're so much fun. What would you say that uh, is the biggest lesson you've learned? Because you went from really like creating, you know, obviously comic books, doing animation. What is the biggest thing that you learned in stepping into this role as a showrunner? Because it's an entirely different skill set. It absolutely is. It's uh, you're suddenly going from working on a comic you might work with maybe four or five other people if you're working on a, you know, a monthly comic. On Nimona, I was just working on my own until I started working with an editor, but I was doing everything myself. With a show, you're working with a team of, there are, I think, 40 crew members just in my office area. And then beyond that, you're working with animators, you're working with sound effects people, you're working with actors, you're working with, you know, all of these other people who play such an integral role in the story. And you have to manage all of those people, which is terrifying. Yeah. And it was really scary. And I was freaked out all the time at first, and I still kind of am, but it's also really great. It's really amazing to work with people who bring their own vision to the show at every single level, you know, f from the very conception when we're just coming up with ideas in the writer's room to the very end when we're just, you know, doing our final sound effects pass and our mix to make it the show that you see on your TVs. Everyone brings something so special and so uniquely them. And the combination of all of those amazing, talented, hardworking, visionary people putting their love into that story, you create something that's really special. Uh, and so that's my favorite thing about it, I think. It's just that it's like, it just, I love the collaborative process. I love being able to work with all these awesome people. Um, and I think it just, it's made the show so much better. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you're working with a project that big, with that many people, I think yeah. you have to love the collaboration yeah. aspect of it because you really do rely so much on it. Who would you say, um, when you first decided, like, this is the thing I want to do, who would you say were some artists or creators that were really inspiring your early work, and, and maybe even now that you kind of look to, to help you like, on your career tra trajectory and where you are right now? Oh, wow. Um, starting out in comics, I was very inspired by, especially a lot of webcomic creators, so, you know, uh, Kate Beaton, uh, who did Harka Vagrant, was one of the first people who inspired me to get into comics at all. Um, Tony Cliff, who did an amazing action-adventure comic called Delilah Dirk, that, um, that was what the first, like, kind of serialized action-adventure webcomic that I saw, and I really wanted to make my own after that. Um, 
And, you know, in animation, there are just so many inspirational people. Um, you know, Craig McCracken was my first showrunner on the first show I was on. Uh, he really inspired me. Um, there are just, I've been inspired and helped along and mentored by so many amazing people that it's, you know, I uh, am so grateful. And so, yeah, they inspire me every day. So I know that uh, you're very, you know, you are very active on social media. And I know that as much love as the show has gotten, which has gotten a lot of love, right? Because we all love Shira, right? <laughs> you're always going to hear like a subset, which feels so much bigger when you're on the internet. Those voices that are not always the happiest, but will sometimes be the loudest. And I think even when you are just existing in a space and you are a fan of a thing, sometimes you do kind of come across that where people want to let their displeasure with your opinion be known. How do you, or how have you navigated that? And what advice would you give to fans that sometimes come across that and with navigating that? For me, I try not to give uh, negativity that comes from a place of poor faith, much of a space in my own online presence or in my own mind. Um, I try to be gentle. There, are, I like a lot of fans. Uh, we we've all done this, I think. Uh, gotten worked up over our favorite properties maybe not being represented the way we want them to be, and I think we've all felt that. So, you know, I, I, I try to be gentle. I try to, you know, be like, maybe this isn't for you. Maybe you'll find something in it that you like. But like either way, I, you can have your opinion. I'm just not gonna try and like change your mind either way, yeah. I guess, uh, unless uh, outside of just what I'm doing with the show. So I think it's just trying to um, surround yourself with positivity, put out positivity, um, let people come to it in their own time, if at all, um, and, you know, just curate a space where you're celebrating what you're making instead of constantly trying to engage with people who really, maybe all they really want to do is just bring you down. So um, for me, that's just, it's, it's always something that you have to learn and practice every single day. Um, but I think it's, it's something important to do. Uh, whatever your online presence is, is just who do you choose to surround yourself with? What sort of things do you choose to look at? Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, just being gentle with yourself, honestly, um, and trying to put something out that as best as you can manage represents something that is positive and something that you believe in and letting it speak for itself. So uh, the show, and I feel like a lot of animated, especially newer animated shows lately, are a lot more inclusive and welcoming, especially to the LGBTQ community. Was this something, yeah, cheer for that. Yeah. Absolutely. And like, I think it's super important because for us to see stuff like that, whether it's animation or, or live action, because you want your media to reflect the world as it actually is, you know, and it helps people be more tolerant and empathetic towards others. How important was, like, was that something you went into it knowing, like, this is the tone that I want this to have, or did it just kind of organically go that way based on where the story was going? I think it organically went that way uh, because those are the sorts of stories that I gravitate towards um, as a gay woman as well. Um, so it was something that I feel very passionate about and um, it is something that I feel a lot of responsibility about uh, because it's, it's giving, especially young people who might be coming to this and figuring out themselves, you, you learn so much by the media that you consume. You see what sorts of people you might want to be. Um, and, and to very, you know, gently and in a very, uh, a way that's friendly to all ages, say like, here are all the different ways that you can choose, that you can express yourself, that you can choose to be, the people you can choose to be around, the way to deal with, uh, with sadness, with disappointment, with, with fear, the way to sort of just navigate the world you're in in a way that's true to yourself. Um, and so that is at the heart of the show. Um, and it, it is at the heart, I think, of every story that I've told. Um, and it's, I think, even when it's not um, front and center, which it often is, um, you ask questions and you very gently pose questions and you question why certain things have to be portrayed in a certain way, why certain characters are the protagonists and others aren't. Um, and so in everything I do, 
I try to question those things and break down those, those barriers where I can. Um, and I think that this show is one that is, you know, uh, the rainbow motif is throughout the whole episode, or the, how, throughout the whole show, and I think that's a really important part of what the show is. I love that. We are gonna play Roll for Questions. Oh boy. Try not to break, break the table this time. <laughs> Look, because apparently, apparently this die is like the heaviest thing ever. This right now. So roll that beautiful rock of a die. Okay. And then I'll whatever number it lands on. It this is going to be a journey for both of us, girl. I, know. I have no idea what these questions are. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. I know, I don't either. Right. This could go great or be a disaster, but I'm All here right. for you. What happens if I roll like a nat one? Or like. I don't really know. I don't know how to be prepared like, for that. Do I have to be like taken out back or like? No, no. Like, well, you heard or... that banging back there. You're next. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, it's been nice knowing you guys. Oh, 14. All right, 14. Let's I see. would, I would solidly defeat like a lower level like goblin character. Like, this is actually making me laugh just because of what you said you were oh going to answer. Oh my god, is it an iguana? No, but you'll see why this actually oh my is god. funny. If the power of flight existed, how much of a problem do you think bug swallowing would be? This is amazing. Okay, so just so <laughs> you guys know, backstage, you know, we were, she was preparing me for this, and I said, no matter what the question is, I'm going to answer an iguana. <laughs> and the question and, is about bug was swallowing. about bug swallowing, <laughs> which is iguana's favorite thing to do, as we all know. Um, so, if you were a flying iguana, which there is actually a <laughs> flying iguana in Shira, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, bug swallowing would not be a problem at all. You'd be really happy. It's actually you'd probably how you'd get your lunch. Feasting on so many delicious bugs. Uh, yeah, that was great. I know. It, was, it really like, worked, worked out. I know. Let's see what the next one brings. Oh, we did Roll more? Again. Okay, all right. <laughs> A tin. All right. I, I might have gotten stabbed by the goblin this round. <laughs> You're stuck on a desert island. What inanimate object do you hope becomes your best friend? And what do you name it? I'd hope to have some sort of perhaps stuffed iguana. <laughs> and name it Iguana? His name would be <laughs> Philroy. The iguana, okay, and he'd be my best friend, and we'd really just hit it off and live on this desert island, and yeah. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I see all this happening in your future. <laughs> <laughs> That's ominous. No, like this isn't getting weird at all. What? <laughs> That's what happens if I roll in that one. I end up on a exactly. desert island, <laughs> <laughs> and then you get beaten. All right, let's do one more. All right. That's a sixteen. All right. I'm not, it's, it's not bad. It's decent. You're in, because I know you're going to say Iguana. <laughs> you're, you're in a huge Game of Thrones battle. What's your weapon of choice? <laughs> a large flying iguana that breathes fire. And eats bugs. <laughs> and eats bugs. <laughs> I don't see what That's could go named, wrong. what's his name again? Like Charlemagne. I don't but know. what did you just name oh, your inanimate one? Oh, different one. one. Yeah. Okay, different iguana this time. Oh, totally different one. Charlemagne that one, the giant That iguana. one's not real. Come this on. one is. <laughs> They're totally different. Yeah, not at all the same or related. You gotta keep up. I know. I'm so sorry. I gotta keep my iguana straight. They do not all look alike. <laughs> um, let's do one more. Okay. Because this is getting all weird right. in the best okay, way possible. Okay. And I just kind of want to keep going down this hole with you. Ooh, 18. How, okay. Mm. Um, how many typos would you say are in the average text message you send? How many what? Typos. Do people not have like autocorrect? Yeah, I don't understand that. Autocorrect. Well, I like this one better. Do ghosts exist and have you ever seen one? Ooh. Let's talk about that. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm definitely staying in a haunted hotel right now. It's really exciting. This is reminding me of John Mulaney's stand up when his, he like talks about how Radio City Music Hall walks through like cold spaces and he's like that was definitely a dead person i yep. wonder who they were yep last time i was like checking into my hotel and i was just like amazing like titanic like 
staircase thing. That Tell I'm, me like, more. It's awesome. <laughs> like all of the lamps are shaped like angels. Like it's it's just it's really cool. Um, but I was checking in. He's like, oh, do you have any questions about the hotel? And I wanted to ask. I'm like, how many ghosts do you have here? But then I was like, I don't know if I want to know right now. I'm gonna ask when I check out. Yeah. <laughs> I think not only do you have to I ask I, that. If there are ghosts, I don't want him to like shape my like perception of right. them. You know, like he's like, we have a 12 year old. You just want to meet them on like, your own. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna like keep an eye out and then yeah. ask on my way out and see if they align. Um, but you definitely should ask that when you check yeah. out. And also, you should tweet and tell us all. I will. <laughs> I will let you know. If yeah. you see any ghosts, you'll be the first to know. All of Twitter will be the first to know. Okay. I don't know if I've ever seen a ghost. I get night terrors sometimes, so I see like faces on my ceiling, but like, yeah, they're fine. They're, they're fine. I mean, it's not, they're up there though, so, you know. I am not it's like not, a not ghost fine. expert, but it's I'm going to okay. assume if they're referred to as night terrors, yeah. they're probably not yeah. fine. That also kind of applies to ghosts, I yeah. guess. Yeah. All right, let's just go with that. Um, <laughs> let's keep going. Roll again. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, was that a nine or a six? That's a nine. Is it? Yeah. It has right. a dot. Oh, yeah, it's a dot yeah. above it. Okay. Wait, now I have to get a totally different card. Really hard work managing the yeah. card in my hand. You're doing great. You're doing a great Thank job. Thank you. You're welcome. I haven't had that much coffee yet, so I appreciate it. I've had too Which much. Which radioactive animal? Oh. Would you. <laughs> Goddamn iguana, man. <laughs> Which radioactive animal would you want to be bitten by to gain their attributes? I mean. <laughs> Do iguanas have the, like, the flicky tongue. It also has yeah. like a cool tongue grabby thing. It can thing. fly. Yeah. yeah. And that can fly. This is cheating, I'm pretty sure. You can't yeah, this is also by sounds like an absolute invisible flying like nightmare of an animal. <laughs> oh, that can teleport and also shapeshift. So basically you I want to be a night crawler from the X. I want all the powers. Okay. Fantastic. Um <laughs> Well, that being said, <laughs> thank you so much for this very strange trip we just went on together. I love it. I'm very excited. <laughs> also, I'm super excited because later on, I am moderating the She-Ra Princess of Power <laughs> panel. So we are going to be even weirder by then because we're going to have a lot more coffee. I'm going to research iguanas before we're gonna research. Then, we're so going to have like have so many, many animal facts, facts for you guys by the, by the panel. <laughs> But everybody watching at home, you can stay tuned and watch all of our coverage from the con by following the hashtags It's a Fan Thing or hashtag ECCC. And uh, coming up next, we have Paul Tobin and Colleen Coover talk Rassel Castle. Whoop whoop. Yes, yeah. I love it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.